Hello, hello. I think we'll get started. Um, so today's material, unfortunately, will be on the exam. So it's entirely possible we're not going to get through this whole lecture. So wherever we get done. So actually, if you ask us questions, there'll be less on this test and more on the harder test. So the first test a little easier. So factor that in as you prioritize questions. So wherever we stop, that's what you need to know for the exam. And if this wants to work, it's just being sporadic. There we go. Okay, so we have a lot of different uh, various dates to keep in mind. Uh, the TA-led review sessions coming up on Sunday. Sarah is orchestrating that event. Um, that's at 8 p.m. in the Science Center in the main gathering area. I have office hours today for two hours right after class at Sydney Frank Hall. TAs are available uh, by appointment. Your sapling problem set, uh, third one is due on Monday. So this is another way to get ready for the exam. And generally, it's, uh, I could have your attention. Hello, the other students are getting frustrated. Um, the, the difficulty of the sapling problem sets is, is it's more difficult than what you're going to see on the exam. So if you look at the type of questions you're getting on sapling, Look at some of those old exams and say it's sort of a little bit unbalanced. So uh, we're not going to ask as difficult questions as the saplings. Uh, so and then midterm, uh, we need to split by last name. This is just not a, a way for us to take an exam. We're all on top of each other. There's nowhere for your coffee and your get yourself nice and calm and, and a zen moment for the exam. So we're going to spread us out. So we almost have every other seat seating for the exam. And I need your help. Uh, you need to go to the right place. If you go to the wrong place, uh, we might not be able to grade your exam. So if you turn your exam in, we'll know what your last name is, just so you know. So I'll have a nice thing on the front of the board. And to remember, uh, last names A through M are in Macmillan. Last names N through C through Bird. Let's settle down, please. Um, OK. So and that's Ernie and Burtville. Uh, that's the thing with the glass greenhouse on top. All right, so we're going to dive right in. And uh, so last time we left off with a few slides remaining, we were, we're thinking about the standard change in free energy for a variety of reactions. We talked about a lot of different hydrolysis reactions. Um, today we're going to be uh, thinking, th there's other things you can do with molecules like rearrangements. So we'll see some examples today of rearrangements. Generally these have a smaller change, standard change in free energy. But what we're going to be doing today is the partial oxidation of glucose. And so the full oxidation of glucose releases tremendous amounts of energy. Um, every two electrons removed from a carbon atom of glucose or every two electrons you remove, it's about 200 kilojoules per mole. And when you think about you know, the magnitude of that, HCB hydrolysis is only 60. So that's a tremendous amount of energy. And today we're in the stepwise process. We're going to be um, removing just two electrons from glucose. And that alone is going to uh, drive gly glycolysis. And so we can have what's referred to as substrate level phosphorylation. So in other words, ATP hydrolysis is less exergonic than hydrolysis of other molecules. And we'll be learning today some reasons why these other molecules, when you um, hydrolyze the phosphate off, why they're more exergonic. So I think there's perhaps an example with phosphocreatine. So look at this. And so when you think about it, hydrolysis of phosphate alpha of ATP gives a rise in resonance stabilization of just the inorganic phosphate and not the ADP. So you still have this sort of Phospho, uh, ester, uh, phospho and hydride bond in the phosphate. It's not really optimal resonance there. But the phosphate, we refer to it as inorganic phosphate. That has beautiful resonance. Um, but so with the ATP hydrolysis, it's just one molecule. One of the two products increases in resonance. Whereas with hydrolysis of these other molecules, in general, both products of the hydrolysis reaction increase in resonance. So for example, creatine can have a resonance form in addition to the resonance within inorganic phosphate. And so this gives rise to a larger uh, uh, negative uh, change in standard free energy. And because this is so exergonic, you can literally have enough energy to do the endergonic 
uh, process of putting a phosphate on an ADP molecule. And we'll see a few examples of this um, substrate level phosphorylation uh, t today and later on. And so um, we have this idea of coupling reactions. So here we have one reaction where we can uh, attack the uh, carboxylate group with this uh, ammonia to form glutamine. So this is one way you could do this reaction. An alternative pathway would be to first attach a phosphate. And so in terms of the organic chemistry, what, what does attaching the phosphate accomplish for you? Yes. Absolutely. So you're increasing the nucleofugacity. Of, so O minus is not a very good leaving group. Phosphate is a great leaving group. So this is driven for this process is exergonic because you have highly exergonic hydrolysis of ATP. Of course, putting a phosphate on a carboxylate is endergonic. These are coupled together, and the net process is exergonic. And of course, a uh, 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 nucleophilic attack of the ammonia on the carboxylate with release of phosphate, that's also exergonic, right, because you have um, great resonance of the product. And so these are two different pathways. And see, we'll see throughout today's lecture, for example, um, where we're coupling reactions together to push difficult chemical transformations forward by coupling them to um, exergonic chemical transformations. Okay, so today's lecture has lots of topics. It's important that you um, remember the oxidation, um, thinking about the oxidation state of carbon atoms. So I actually had a question for you. So after last lecture, I was informed that they actually dropped sugar organic chemistry from Orgo. So what, so did you, do you guys get that anywhere else? Good God. <laughs> well, so remember that I give you a lot of hints, and I'm sorry I didn't know that, because in the past they did have sugar chemistry. Look for the carbon with two oxygens bound. I mean, that trick and the trick for specifying alpha and beta. Those are really important things. Um, but yeah, definitely review that lecture. Um, I'm in office hours. If you're still confused, it's totally understandable. I didn't realize it's the first time I was throwing this at you. Um, so uh, today also will probably be a lot of similar things. Hi, how are you? Should we know some of the arbitrary names? Um, well, so technically, you know, I, legally you're responsible for knowing everything on every slide, but I surely know probably maybe 10% of what's on every slide, and I, <laughs> I uh, don't have to take the exam, fortunately. Um, but I would say that, uh, like, am I going to ask you which sugars are in sucrose? Probably not. Um, Am I going to ask you to draw a structure like draw galactose? Probably not. Um, things that I would not tend to remember. If you see me, if you go through the video and you see me getting like talking really fast and getting excited, I, I'm more likely to think of those topics when I'm writing an exam. So, but uh, I'm only, I haven't finished writing the exam, so I don't know what's going so these are good questions. Well, let's move on. We have a lot uh, to cover. So the types of, it, we've looked at uh, different types of enzymes so far. I'm going to introduce a new class today. And these are these, uh, this class of oxidoreductases. These enzymes are going to help to catalyze the transfer of electrons between two reactions. Uh, and so these also are commonly called dehydrogenases. So if you see the word dehydrogenase uh, in the name of an enzyme, well, those are going to be oxidoreductases. And so we need to think about this transfer. So the chemical process here is moving electrons from one molecule to another. Okay, and so you have, obviously, if you're moving from one to another, one of the molecules is donating the electrons, the other is receiving the electrons. Um, and so we can call these reducing agents and oxidizing agents. But you never have... Um, like removal of electrons from a molecule and then you just sort of toss them in solution because that wouldn't work. You always need to tra transfer those electrons to some other molecule, uh, otherwise, you know, because electrons are not stable. Okay, and so the way we can think of this, so we need to eventually think about, okay, what's the standard change in free energy of these types of reactions because that's the type of energy we're going to harness in burning fuels. 
And so to begin to think about that, we need to think about the affinity of uh, certain molecules for electrons. And so this is a table. This table is derived from an experiment I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And this maps how high of an affinity each of these molecules has for an electron. So for example, oxygen has the highest affinity for electrons on this table, and ferridoxin has the lowest affinity of, of, of for electrons. And so as this number increases, there's a higher affinity. You can also call them stronger oxidants, stronger reductants, but in my mind, it's a lot easier to think about electron affinity. It wants an electron or it doesn't want an electron as much. Okay, and so each of these are half reactions. Enzymes are not just catalyzing, you know, electrons coming from nowhere and being deposited on a, a molecule. They're transferring electrons between molecules. So you always have one molecule being reduced and the other molecule uh, being oxidized. Right, and so, moving along, or not, there we go. Did I skip one? Maybe. Uh, sorry. Right, and so these are standard changes in free energy, and so these are from our stand same standard state, right? One molar concentration of everything except for water and, uh, uh, and uh, protons, which are 10 to the minus 7 molar, okay? So, but these are relative to a standard state, and that you might think, okay, well, that's nice, but the cellular state is not likely to be that. And so these uh, electron affinity can be modulated by the concentration of uh, the acceptor and the donator of electrons. And so the, here's the experimental setup to um, calculate these voltages. So what was on that table was simply putting certain substances in this setup and looking at the voltmeter to see the voltage read. So this voltmeter doesn't know how many electrons are being released per molecule. It just measures the flow of electrons. And the way we do this is that we have a reference standard, and that is a hydrogen gas bubble that this partial pressure um, gives one molar uh, concentration of protons, right? And so this is our reference state. So for example, if we put the same hydrogen gas on this side, the same partial pressure, the voltage measured would be zero. Right, so that's set arbitrarily at zero. We can calibrate our voltmeter, and that reaction is set at zero. But now we can put other substances in their standard state, one molar concentration, over here, and we can measure the flow of electrons. So if what's over here has a higher affinity for electrons than hydrogen, then uh, you'll get a positive voltage. So, uh, and if they have a lower affinity, electrons will go in the opposite direction. You'll have a negative voltage. Now, if you just had volt electrons moving in a one-way process, uh, that would tend to accumulate electrons. That would not be bad. So you have this bridge in between to allow you to have a current through this system so you can flow uh, the electrons. So this is the type of uh, experimental setup that gave the values in that table. And so you always have uh, an oxidized form of the molecule plus some electrons giving the reduced form. And these reduction potentials, as I just described, are relative to this, this particular reaction. Uh, of hydrogen, so that's set at a, uh, a voltage of zero. And so we always need to transfer electrons between substances, and so it's not enough to just say, to characterize a reaction, to just say, um, what is the voltage measured in this setup um, when I release electrons? Because in a real biochemical reaction, those electrons will be received, and the affinity of the receiver will affect you know, the process. And so what's important here is a change in free energy or a change in this uh, reduction potential. And this is defined as the reduction potential of the molecule being reduced minus the reduction potential of the molecule being oxidized. And so if you look back at that table, it's always something plus electrons gives something, right? So if you're being reduced, you're gaining electrons. So, but if you're transferring molecules, one molecule is going to gain electrons, one's going to lose. So you have to subtract the one uh, that's being oxidized. And I'll give you an example. It's a bit abstract, hard to conceive of. Let's look at a particular example. Let's look at the transfer of electrons uh, from ethanol to iron. So iron is being reduced, ethanol is being oxidized. And so we have in this table a, a reduction potential for each of these reactions. So how can we describe the overall process? 
uh, the, the, the standard change in reduction potential is the molecule uh, being reduced, iron, right, 0.771 minus the reduction potential of the molecule being oxidized here. So you see how this is actually over here reversed. Ethanol is on this side, so acid aldehyde is here. And that's why you have to subtract that reduction potential. So for the overall process, the change in reduction potential is nearly a volt. And so this is the type of chemistry that's going to occur when we, um, we do glycolysis. So we're going to be removing electrons from carbon-containing uh, molecules. And so uh, this is a lot of uh, reduction potential change, but you obviously want to think about, okay, that's nice, but spontaneity of a reaction is determined by delta G. This just says, you know, the flow of electrons. This gives you a general sense for the relative affinity for electrons of these two half reactions. So, but we need to, to understand um, how we can think about the standard change in free energy, we have to be able to be really solid on this slide. So this is a very important slide. You put a circle, you put a star. So you need to be able to look at a molecule. And this is sort of like the importance of finding the hemiacetal, hemiketo. This is really core to this lecture. So you need to be able to look at each of these carbon atoms and determine their oxidation state. And so the way this works is that the most electronegative atom owns the bonding electrons. And as it turns out, although there isn't much difference in the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen, uh, carbon is slightly more electronegative. So it owns those bonding electrons. So for example, you know, methane, hydrogen doesn't get any of these electrons, so that carbon's oxidation state is eight. Here you have two, four, six. Now here we have the same atom, so they equally share. They have the same electronegativity. And so that's an oxidation state of seven. Um, but we can also think of, so here we have the numbers of the oxidation state of the carbon that's highlighted uh, in pinkish, reddish sort of color. But you can also think of, you know, throughout the sugars, each carbon and what each carbon's oxidation state is. So let's just focus on this one on the end here. So here we have oxidation state of seven. Here do you see it going down by two electrons? Do you see that? So you get one, two, three, four, five. So you've gone from seven to five because now you, instead of having a bond to hydrogen, you have a bond to oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative. It hogs those electrons. And so this is a two electron oxidation to the alcohol. Uh, and so you might think of uh, fatty acids. Those are very reduced forms of carbon, and um, these in sugars, you know, you begin to have a lot of hydroxyl groups, and so those are more uh, oxidized form uh, of carbon. But you can keep going with this. You can now form a double bond, and now you just get one, two, three electrons for that carbon. And here, uh, you just have one electron. So going from the aldehyde um, to the carboxylic acid, uh, you only have one electron. So these are two electron hops for each of these processes. Does that make sense so far? And I find it useful. Look, as you look at molecules in the lecture slides, look at all the carbons and try to think about the oxidation state of each one. Get some practice at this. Because it's important to map where the electrons are going. The energy we're harnessing is coming from the oxidation of these fuels. And that oxidation is the movement of electrons. That's literally providing the chemical energy here. Okay. And so, the standard change in free energy, the standard reduction potential change, uh, is insufficient to fully explain a particular reaction because that's the standard state. And you might guess biochemistry rarely occurs in a standard state. It's useful because you can have a table and it can be predetermined and you can look up these things. Um, but what's really important is the cellular state. So remember, we had a similar conversation where we are talking about the change in Gibbs free energy. You had the standard state, delta G, and you had delta G. Here you have E and E prime naught. And so if you, for example, increase the concentration of an electron acceptor, you're increasing the affinity for electrons. So by modulating these concentrations, you're affecting uh, the reduction potential, right? And so this happens in a cell. For example, um, NAD uh, concentrations are not one-to-one -one with NADH. They're manipulated, okay? And so 
NAD it tends to be higher concentration than NADH. And this makes uh, this electron uh, potential higher, more positive. And as we'll see in the next slide, it translates into a more exergonic process. So we can play the same tricks we did with Gibbs free energy with these reduction potentials by manipulating the concentrations of the acceptor and the donor. So here's a cri another critical slide. This is a very important equation. So here we're going from an experimental piece of data, a reduction potential from this experimental setup, to a prediction of spontaneity of the reaction, whether at equilibrium a reaction will tend to favor the products or the reactants. And so delta G is sort of inversely related to the change in this reduction potential. So as the reduction potential becomes more positive, delta G becomes more negative, and therefore the process is more exergonic. At equilibrium, you will have the accumulation of products. And this, if you actually plug the numbers in here, look at this. This is freaking amazing. One volt, plug that in here, times 96. Here we have the number of electrons transferred. So before we didn't have that, because our experiment couldn't tell where did that electron come from. It was just a voltmeter. But here we need to factor that in. So we have nearly 200 kilojoules per mole. What's well, just a simple two electron oxidation of one carbon atom. So if you think about the glucose molecule, each, on average, each of those carbon atoms are in oxidation state of four. The ends sort of average out, if you map that out. So we have four electrons times six carbon atoms, every two electrons coming out generates a flash of energy. There's a tremendous amount of energy released here. Okay, so positive standard changes in a reduction potential equate to negative changes in free energy. Okay, so this is the process that's going to drive, um, drive the creation of, of, of or the uh, harnessing of energy. Uh, and so we have a variety of things that are important in this process. And so remember, we learned ATP hydrolysis, a Gibbs change of free energy from standard state around 30, from the cellular state generally around 50 or 60. That's not enough. These electrons are coming off two at a time. That's 200 kilojoules per mole. So we can't catch that energy just in forming, for example, a phospho uh, anhydride bond to ADP from, with a phosphate, we need something else to catch this energy. If we don't catch it, it's just going to be given off as heat. That'll be wasted. We won't be able to use it for biochemical processes. So we have a variety of electron catchers. And isn't it surprising? Look at the placement where nature has selected these catchers from. Remember, this is a scale of electron affinity. So the things that are, you, you might guess, well, if you want to catch something, you've got to have a good grip. You've got to grab it really tightly. But these are, have very low electron affinity. Okay? But when you release the electron from these, you can release a tremendous amount of energy. But it's a little bit, it might be a little counterintuitive. So let's look at the structures of some of these. Um, uh, pyridine nucleotide coenzymes. So here um, there's NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, we can have an, a, variant, a variant of NAD with a phosphate here. But the business end of this molecule is this pyridine ring, this nicotinamide ring. And so this molecule, when you put two electrons into this molecule, you go to this form of that uh, nicotinamide ring. Do you see how you're destroying aromaticity? Do you see why it makes sense you probably would have a low electron affinity? Because this thing's like, I really sort of like being aromatic. You know, you're making me be not aromatic. But this is stable enough. There's an activation barrier to this energy that it's still sufficient to catch those electrons. Okay? But you can imagine, if I remove these electrons from NAD, that's going to re release a lot of energy because you're going to go from non-aromatic back to aromatic. Okay, so you, do you see the ADP molecule here? So you have ADP attached to another ribose uh, here. So here we have a five position, five position linkage of this, uh, these two phosphates. But then we have this ring. And so NAD cannot accept one electron at a time. It can only accept two at a time. Okay. 
with me so far. And it's useful to have two different forms of this because they can be used separately. So if you have two pools, they can be at different concentrations. So in general, NAD is used in the production of energy, especially in aerobic respiration. Uh, it's, it generally transports its electrons into something called an electron transport train, and that generates a large amount of ATP. NADP, on the other hand, is used for a variety of processes that build um, molecules. So we call these anabolic processes. And so if we have separate pools, we can have separate concentrations, and we can uh, have a bit of independence in those. So the other uh, electron catcher is FAD, or uh, F, uh, yeah, FAD. And so this is a one electron catcher. And so you, again, you have ADP. So if you know the structure of ADP, by the end of the class, you're going to have to know ADP, because we're going to go all into the pathways that make it. And so here again, you have these two phosphates, but you're attached to an isoloxazine ring. And this is aromatic, but then you can, again, disrupt the aromaticity by gently one electron at a time um, putting those electrons in the molecule. And so this has a generally a somewhat low electron affinity because you're going from aromatic to not aromatic. Okay, and some biochemical processes um, it's useful to be able to transfer one electron at a time. For glycolysis, we're not going to see it, but for other processes, you'll see it throughout the semester. Any questions on this so far? I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. Yes? Can FAD also accept two? Only two. NAD is two or nothing. FAD can go to two. It can accept either one or two. That's right. It's more flexible. And uh, one other question from the yep. audience. Why does a positive uh, delta E imply negative delta G? Um, it's just because the equation delta G equals negative N F E delta E. Um, so it's a good question. Okay, so um, looking at NAD and NADP, they have a useful biochemical property. So if you want to measure the rate of a oxidation reduction chemistry occurring within an enzyme, you can measure uh, the appearance or disappearance of uh, the reduced form of NADH that has a unique absorbance uh, at 340, okay, that you don't see uh, when you uh, have, when you're lacking those two electrons. And so this is useful if you want to do some kinetics, for example, on enzymes that are pushing electrons away. So this is sort of a, a side. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that this redox chemistry is indicated on the slides throughout the semester. So you can directly transfer electrons between atoms, so especially metal ions. So here we have one uh, being reduced, the other being oxidized. You can transfer electrons that can hitch a ride on a hydrogen atom or a hydride ion. So for example, uh, the, for NAD, you can think of it as a transfer of a hydride ion uh, to NAD. Okay, and you can also change the oxidation state of a molecule by forming a bond uh, to oxygen. Okay, and, but these, in the case of these carbon oxidations we're going to be seeing today, those are two electron oxidations, where these other ones don't necessarily have to be two electron uh, oxidations reductions. Okay, and so this is the general process that we're looking at some nomenclature. Here's some more nomenclature that you might see throughout the semester. You can uh, think of this as transfer of protons and electrons, hydrogen atoms or hydride ions. Um, these are just different notations. When you see these types of notations, you typically see that these are dehydrogenase enzymes. Okay, so this is just to make you familiar with notation. Okay. So in general, um, there's two separate processes. You can either destroy things or do construction, right? So uh, generally, so today we're going to be looking at destruction the uh, disassembly of a sugar molecule into a simpler forms. And these catabolic, uh, so your metabolism is change throwing, that's the Latin uh, origin. So, and so catabolism, this is the destructive processes. You take fuels and you disassemble them. Anabolism are the construction, the constructive processes. You're building from simple precursors more complex molecules. And so the next three lectures, it's all going to be about destruction, destructive lectures. 
Um, but then for the rest of the semester, we'll be looking a lot at anabolism, the building up of molecules. And so that if you look at, going back, what we're doing is we're transferring molecules. As we're destroying molecules, we're gaining energy. And that energy is being pumped into constructive processes of building new molecules. So this energy is transferred um, by uh, hitching a ride on ATP or some of these uh, reduced uh, cofactors. And then anabolic processes will use this energy, for example, harness the energy by hydrolyzing ATP or, uh, or uh, oxidizing NADH. And then these, these molecules will be ready again for catabolism. So these things, these smaller molecules are shuttling energy around these two processes. And so catabolic processes, you can consume all kinds of fuels. You can destroy lots of stuff, right? And so here is, you can, you can disassemble fats, sugars, or polymers of sugars. Even amino acids can be disassembled. But all of these catabolic pathways converge onto a very limited number of intermediates. So acetyl-CoA is one great example. Now we can burn these things and make ATP molecules, um, or we can build up them into more complex molecules. So do you see how the arrows are all pointing to one molecule here, and then the anabolic processes, you have a, diversity is increasing. So that's a general theme you'll see of anabolic and catabolic pathways. Okay, so today we're doing glycolysis, and this is sort of getting ready for the rampant um, burning of fuel. So today we're just going to extract a very small amount of energy out of a glucose molecule. But then in the next lecture, we're going to be uh, harnessing a tremendous amount of energy from the, the remaining carbon, the reduced carbons in the uh, glucose molecule. And, so, and then in the, the third lecture, we're going to be looking at how do, we, um, uh, how do we make ATP molecules through electron transport? How do we get the energy out of those reduced cofactors? So today we're doing glycolysis, so Latin is sugar splitting. So it's important that we be able to see the point here is to break this glucose molecule into two, two three-carbon sugars, so two trioses. And because the next step, you know, after you make the triose, you can decarboxylate, and then you have a two-carbon molecule, and that's what you're going to really um, work on and through the Krebs cycle, which is coming up later. Okay, so... Let's look at glycolysis. We're going to go through this. This is the most important pathway in terms of evolution out there. Every organism has glycolysis. It's in all of your cells. Um, it's central core skeleton of all of metabolism, glycolysis and then the Krebs cycle. So we're going to, spend, we're going to go really into the details. Later in the semester, when we're talking about other pathways, we're not going to have this type of, of depth. So let's look at this. Let's think about the oxidation state of all the carbons in glucose. Do you see I've written them here? Do you see how it makes sense? So here, right, you have two hydrogens, so you've got four or five oxidation state. Here you have a double bond to an oxygen, you have three. But do you see how the average of these numbers are four? So you have four electrons on average from each carbon atom that can be removed. Every two electrons you remove releases about 200 kilojoules per mole. So, but if you break this down to the simplest part, you have for every carbon atom, you're getting four electrons out of it. And today, glycolysis uh, of, you know, so what is that? Uh, six times four, 12, 24, right? So, so in all, you can remove 24 electrons from glucose, but today we're only going to be removing two. So we're going to be splitting the sugar and only removing two electrons from the whole molecule. And so that never works. <laughs> That's fuel, fire. So what we don't want to do here is if you take a log and you set it on fire, it's the exact same chemistry. And it's good for roasting marshmallows, making s'mores, not good for driving biochemical processes. It's hard to catch that heat. You'll burn yourself. So today, instead of rampant, uncontrolled oxidation of glucose, we're going to disassemble this molecule very, very slowly and carefully, catching that energy on these electron carriers. Right, so yay, burn, or not. Okay, 
So oxygen, but the, the end point here is if you fully um, oxidize the glucose molecule, well, you're going to transfer those electrons ultimately onto the molecule with the highest electron affinity, the oxygen uh, molecule. Okay? And so we're transferring these electrons in the end game from glucose uh, to oxygen to form carbon dioxide. And so on average, um, you're re releasing, you know, approaching nearly 500 kilojoules per mole uh, per carbon atom. Right? And so we have six carbon atoms. But we can't catch those on a 50 kilojoule per mole carrier. You know, you just, there's no enzymes that can phosphorylate like five ADP simultaneously. That doesn't exist. So we're going to use these uh, reduced cofactors to catch a large amount of the energy. And we're going to be very, it's amazing how evolution has figured this out, very strategic in the way that we manipulate the molecules. So we're going to leave, you know, we might take an ATP off, but we're going to leave a lot of energy in the molecule, and that, that will, will create some very unstable intermediates. And that way, in two different steps, we can slowly take energy out. You'll see that in a moment. It's, it's amazing how strategic this is. So this is the preparatory phase of glycolysis. So here you have um, the, it seems like you're kind of productive. So the purpose here is to burn fuels, make heat, you know, make energy, catch that energy. But here, you're hydrolyzing two ATP molecules. Does that make any bit of sense? You're actually losing in the game. But you have to invest to make a dividend. Right? So if you don't invest any energy, you're not going to get these molecules to the stage where you can extract energy. They're not ready to extract energy as they come in as glucose molecules. So we're going to phosphorylate various positions on the sugar and do some rearrangements. And then we have an enzyme called aldolase, which is the sugar lysing step. And it's very important that you see which bonds are breaking. The whole point of this pathway is to break this, uh, this hexose into two trioses. And so we're going to break this molecule in two, shown here in this schematic, into two trioses. Okay, so that's the preparatory phase. In terms of catching energy, not productive so far. We've actually invested two ATPs. But then in the payoff phase, the show me the money phase, we're going to not only regain those two ATPs we initially invested, but we're going to yield a dividend of two ATPs. So every glucose molecule that goes into glycolysis, you have the net production of two ATPs. And you have the reduction of the NAD oxidized cofactor to its reduced form. So some of our energy is ending up in ATP, some is ending up in NADH. Okay, so this is the overall schematic. Okay, one at a time, nice and simple. Ease into it. So can you imagine that it makes sense to put a phosphate, to make a new chemical bond of phosphate on a glucose, that's going to be endergonic, right? How happy, I mean, so you're, you're putting this negative charge on the glucose molecule, that's endergonic. But the enzyme is coupling two reactions, ATP hydrolysis and phosphorylation of glucose. And this ATP hydrolysis is more exergonic than glucose phosphorylation is endergonic. Do you see that? So when you couple these together, you have a, a pretty highly exergonic uh, overall process starting for the standard state. Okay, and so ATP hydrolysis is driving this reaction. The enzyme is called hexokinase. Um, hexokinase is a C6 nonspecific kinase. So you'll see examples of other sugars that can be phosphorylated at the C6 position. Remember, you've got to go back to that sugar lecture. You've got to get the numbering of the sugar molecules down to be able to understand glycolysis. So this is C6 phosphorylated in hexokinase is the enzyme that does that. So we've now phosphorylated glucose. And this has some strategic benefits. Through evolution, say, you know, those glute transporters, they sort of, they're nice, they get the glucose in, but they're in equilibrium. So if you build up the concentration of glucose in the cell, if it gets too high, you'll start exporting the glucose back out of the cell. It'll see, hey, glucose transporter, cool, let's go back out. But if you phosphorylate it, when the phosphorylated sugar molecule comes to the glucose transporter, it's like, uh, I don't know what the, it would go away. You, I'm not giving you a ride. You're phosphorylated. So by phosphorylating the glucose, you're trapping it. 
helping to accumulate glucose within the cell because phosphorylate glucose doesn't go on those transporters. You're also putting some energy into this molecule and you're going to use that energy to break a carbon-carbon bond. How strong is a carbon-carbon bond? That's pretty strong. So you're going to have to configure this molecule to have a lot of energy invested in it. It's going to have to be a pretty unstable molecule to break a carbon-carbon bond. Okay? And so also by adding the phosphate, you can think about it. All of the substrates here are going to have this negative charge throughout the pathway. And that's handy because you can have pretty tight binding of your enzyme to these metabolites because you could strategically place a positively charged amino acid, which would bind in a charge-charge interaction with the phosphate. If you didn't have a charge on here, you know, you wouldn't have these ch the possibility of strong charge-charge interactions. So remember, it's a balance. You don't want it to bind too tightly, but it does allow you to specifically help to improve the specificity of the interaction of the, in the various enzymes with the metabolites. So the next step is a uh, summarization. So do you see the aldose? C1, remember this can equilibrate with the linear form. And then you've uh, isomerized to a ketose. So now you have carbonyl group here, if you open this up. These are all equilibrium, there's still mutarotation. The hexokinase, and a lot of these enzymes are somewhat indiscriminating in the anomer that they take as substrates. Right, but it doesn't really matter, even if they had a preference for one, these are all equilibrating. They're still hemiacetals and hemiketal. So even if the, each of these enzymes could take one form, well, it's, that's okay because the other form would interchange to that. Okay? And so we've isomerized. We're now at ketose. We still have six carbons. Isomerization, you're just rearranging bonds so that it's um, pretty close to uh, equilibrium starting from the standard state. And now, we're going to put a little bit more energy in here. You see the strategy? You're amping this molecule. You're now going to phosphorylate the C1 position with a second kinase called PFK1, phosphofructokinase. Transfer a phosphate onto this molecule makes this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, and so this is exergonic because ATP hydrolysis is more exergonic than phosphorylation of the sugar is endergonic. Okay, so these reactions, again, are coupled, and uh, starting from the standard state, tend to favor formation of products. Are you with me so far? All right, I know, I know. I went through it, too, as a student. Um, so let's think about, throughout the semester, we're going to think about the regulation of pathways. And as it turns out, the most exergonic step are the rate-limiting steps. Not because of the thermodynamics, but because evolution has decided, let's decrease the abundance of the enzymes in these steps. That would be cool because not only, so if they're very exergonic, that means in effect they're not in equilibrium, right? So that they're, they're grossly favoring the formation of products. Once you've made a product, it's not going to go back. So that's a one-way valve, right? So that, that helps us to commit into this pathway. And so if we limit the enzymes here, we can really regulate the process. So the two kinases, the two steps where we added a phosphate to the sugar molecule, are enzyme limited. There's just a very small amount of enzyme. And these steps occur very far from equilibrium, starting from the standard state. So you tend to accumulate a bit of, of, of molecules here in this process. Okay, so we want to regulate the flux of uh, sugar molecules through this process because the energy demand of the cells is not a constant. There's an environment. Sometimes if I'm running around, I need to make more energy. If I stop and veg out on the couch, I need less energy. If I eat a meal, then I've got tons of fuel. What am I going to do with that? I might need to store some of that. So you need to balance the amount of energy available to whatever is necessary for uh, the organism. And so this is, these are the steps that are regulated. Let's look at some of this. Uh, and so this is what I just mentioned uh, in words. We also have a variety of fuels, and different fuels are, have different efficiencies for extraction of energy. Uh, lipids have you know, tons of reduced carbons, and so those you can get even more energy out. And those are useful for storage of uh, energy. Okay, and so, uh, 
So there's different characteristics of these allosterically regulated enzymes. Remember, the regulation is going to occur at a site other than the active site changing the shape of the enzyme. And so these uh, regulated steps are going to control the rate of the entire pathway. Because, you know, if you stop one step, the rest of the steps are just going to have to wait for um, that slow step to proceed. Okay, and so these are one-way valves. Effectively, irreversibly, nature said, hey, this is a one-way valve. Once it's gone past this step, so much energy has been released, it's, it's very unlikely to go in the reverse direction. And in general, these regulated steps are going to have different enzymes in different directions. That makes sense. So, so we'll see later on in the semester, we can take um, simple molecules and build up sugars. That's called gluconeogenesis. But you don't want this to be a circle. You don't want to break down sugars, build them up, break them down, build them up. You're, nothing productive is happening. So the enzymes, you have to independently control whether the, the pathways are going up or down. And this, this will become more clear throughout the semester. Okay, so these two steps, step one and three, as I've already mentioned, highly exergonic, see there's just one arrow, not really much of a back arrow, and those are the steps that are actually regulated. Let's look at the logic of the regulation. It's pretty cool. So here, here is hexokinase. Uh, this is the uh, active site of the enzyme where you're going to be putting a phosphate at the C6 position of a variety of different sugars, including glucose. And this is the allosteric site. This is where allosteric regulators are going to bind. It's at a site other than the active site, okay? And so, and it's sort of interesting. Hexokinase is actually inhibited by its own product, glucose 6-phosphate. So let's look at this. So you have ATP and citrate. So ATP is a general indicator of the amount of energy already available to the cell. You want to keep that at a certain level so that your processes in your cells can occur. Um, and Oh, sorry. I thought we had a slide showing. Yeah, so I guess glucose 6-phosphate is the only negative regulator of hexokinase. I thought there was a slide that described that. This is the second step um, that uh, the allosteric regulation of this other kinase. Remember, it's one way, highly exergonic because uh, of ATP hydrolysis. In this step, the substrate inhibits the enzyme. Really? Doesn't that seem counterproductive? It would be if that regulation were occurring at the active site, but it's not. It's occurring at the allosteric site. And um, the amount of ATP necessary to turn the enzyme off allosterically is higher than the amount that you actually need for the reaction. So as the ATP levels get really high, um, it's going to actually turn the enzyme off. But at a lower level, um, there'll still be enough for us push this reaction forward. And so it's a bit surprising um, to think about. Okay. Sorry. Right. okay, and these are the, the curves, and you can see at low ATP, um, you're, you're grabbing your substrates tighter, right? You know, the apparent affinity is increased because K, K.5 is decreased. Okay, so this is the critical step. This is where we've built up to this moment. This is the time, man. This is when we're going to break this sugar molecule into two pieces. So if we're going to disassemble molecules, we've got to eventually break some carbon-carbon bonds. And so we're taking fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, a very unstable molecule, and in one uh, step, breaking it into two triose phosphates. It's a ketose and an aldose, the two products. And you have to look there. This is a good a slide for you later on to practice oxidation states. Ask yourself the question, is there oxidation or reduction here? I mean, you can sort of cheat and say, I didn't see any NAD, I didn't see any electron carriers, yes. But if you actually look at it, we've redistributed the electrons amongst these two parts of the molecule, but no electrons have been removed. So this is not an oxidation reduction reaction. This is just a cleavage of this sugar. And this, even though we've, we've put all these phosphates here, phosphates are going to tend to repel. You put them on a small molecule, it's a good thing to have a split up of this molecule. But still, starting from the standard state, highly endergonic. And so you might imagine, wow, that's, that's going to be tough. 
And the way that evolution has figured out to deal with this is to strategically place one of the fastest enzymes known to biochemistry right after this step. And so that has the effect of rapidly whisking the products away, in effect decreasing the concentration of one of the products and, and making delta G close close to zero. So this process actually occurs. Delta G is around zero. So it's very close to equilibrium, equilibrium because of the strategic placement of Superman enzyme in the next step. And so here is Mr. Superman. This thing, um, the instant, it's just a matter of diffusion. As soon as this substrate touches this enzyme, bam, it turns it into this other molecule. Okay, and so now from the one hexose, we have two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. And this is just an isomerization. So uh, the standard change in free energy uh, is uh, just slightly endergonic. And actually, delta G is very close to zero in this step um, because of some of the subsequent steps. OK? So we've accomplished our goal. And now we're going to, but we still haven't harvested any ATP. We've put it two ATPs in. We split the molecule in two. We haven't made any, uh, captured any energy yet. We need to do that. So this is triose phosphate. It's diffusion limited. Two times 10 to the eight per molar second uh, is the KCAT over KM. So it's an amazing, amazing enzyme. Not coincidentally placed after a really tough chemical transformation. So it's important for the clicker um, that you be able to um, track which bond is broken. The whole point of this pathway is to break a, a molecule into two. So let's just remember where we're breaking the molecule. If you're making two trioses, you could guess where it's going to break, right, between C3 and C4. Okay, and so if you map this, um, so you're making from fructose 1,6-bis-phosphate these two molecules and eventually two molecules of glycerol by 3-phosphate. So C1 and C6 have now become C3 because of our conventions of naming. Remember, the most oxidized carbon is where we start the numbering. So this is 1, 2, 3 in this glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, right? Okay? So carbon 1 and carbon 6 end up over here, okay? We broke, obviously, carbon 3 and 4 because we make, just remember, we make tr two trioses. The only way you're going to make two trioses is if you break carbon three and four. So we've invested two ATPs, and now we've got to show me the money. Come on, man, the payoff phase. Woo! So here we go. So this is the big payout, man. This is the Jerry Maguire moment right here. So we're taking glyceraldehyde three phosphate um, plus inorganic phosphate, and we're oxidizing, do you see this? The aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. Do you see this? So this is a two-electron oxidation, releasing a flaming amount of energy. Some of that energy is captured in NADH, but even NADH alone is not enough to catch it all. You've also caught some more energy by driving a very unfavorable process. You've taken a three-carbon sugar that already has one phosphate, and you stuck another one on. So this now is a triose bisphosphorylated molecule. So some of that oxidation energy is captured in NADH. Some is still in this molecule. And in the next step, we're going to uh, synthesize you know, a molecule of ATP because the hydrolysis of this insanely energetic molecule is more exergonic than ATP hydrolysis. So we can do s this substrate level phosphorylation that we've been talking about. This molecule is so mussed up, so unstable, that these two enzymes have to huddle together. If this molecule were to be released into the cytosol, it would probably spontaneously decompose, it's spontaneously hydrolyze. We have to very carefully as soon as this is made, whisk it away to the next step. Give it to the next enzyme, where we're going to then catch the rest of that energy on an ADP molecule, making the ATP. Okay, so these two reactions, the two enzymes, are physically associated, and there's a channel between them. Let's look at the energy. We've already thought about this a lot. 
Um, so NADH, remember there's a large amount of energy uh, captured in NADH, but then we're driving the highly endergonic uh, addition of a phosphate to this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that has a, uh, is, is endergonic to the tune of 50 kilojoules per mole, right? And so, but when we couple all of these things together, starting from the standard state, we're reasonably close to equilibrium, okay? And this, the energy here is this oxidation uh, and reduction chemistry. That's what's driving this. So this is the moment of harnessing the energy. And so, but then in this next step, we're transferring, we can look at the free energy as well. So hydrolysis of a second phosphate off of this triose is more exergonic than hydrolysis of ATP. So adding a phosphate onto ADP is endergonic. And this is more exergonic. The reason it's more exergonic is because there's more, you know, in orgo, it's either steric, chemist, steric hindrance or resonance, right? So 50-50 chance, man. So there's more resonance here. Why? Look, it's a carboxylate. Both products have increased resonance, whereas with uh, ATP hydrolysis, just the phosphate has increased resonance. So it's more exergonic. It can drive substrate level uh, phosphorylation. So here it is. Up here, we can literally transfer the phosphate directly onto an ADP because both the inorganic phosphate and this molecule have a high degree of resonance. It's doubly stabilized. Okay. So these things are literally coupled together. And when you add everything up, it's net exergonic, the whole process. So it tends to be actually pretty reasonably close to equilibrium. Okay. And here's the picture of this idea of not letting the hot potato get away. So here we have one scenario where we could potentially release our this phosphorylated triose into solution and see what happens. It's not going to be good. Um, what nature has come up with is let's get this right to the next enzyme and then immediately make an ATP molecule. So we have substrate channeling between these two enzymes through a physical interaction of them. Okay. And so here we uh, can continue on. So we now have 3 phosphoglycerate, uh, and this is sort of finishing up and getting to the final uh, state, which is pyruvate. So we have 3 phosphoglycerate. Um, you can rearrange this through a mutase. Uh, intermediate in this step is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Remember where we saw this? This hemoglobin sits in the donut. It's the donut hole, man. It's the donut hole right there. That's the intermediate in this step. Okay, and so 3-phosphoglycerate is mutated to 2-phosphoglycerate. We're setting things up again here for another highly exergonic process. So now we have an enol ACE, right, which is catalyzing the elimination of water, forming a double bond, phosphoenol pyruvate. So both of these steps are close to equilibrium, starting from the standard state. And now we're going to take that PEP, or phosphoenol pyruvate, and do another substrate level phosphorylation, transfer the phosphate from PEP um, to ATP. And you can then think there, obviously, um, the hydrolysis or the removal of phosphate from PEP is more exergonic than the removal of phosphate from ATP. And so you can think about, okay, why might that be? So here is, that's actually the most exergonic process, right, the tra this transfer of phosphate. And the reason is because of this enol ketol um, uh, tautomerization. So you have the enol form of pyruvate, which in a blink of an eye, transforms into the keto form, uh, which is the, the most stable form of pyruvate. And this helps to, to make this, this, this energy that's released is tremendous here because of this isomerization. So it sort of strategically places a flash of release of energy at the very end of the pathway, because up to this point, equilibrium, 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 pull, equilibrium, equilibrium, you see it? At the end of the pathway, it's very exergonic that pulls flux through the pathway, okay? Everything here is strategically designed. Pull. It's like a tug of war. And so this is the overall process. We invested two uh, ATPs in the preparatory phase and the payoff phase. We've harvested the two and invested, made a dividend of two, and we've captured some of those electrons on NAD. 
Now, in the presence of oxygen, we could do something with those electrons. We could make ATP. But in the absence of oxygen, if we keep doing glycolysis, every time you do one round of glycolysis, you have one less NAD molecule. So say you had a million molecules of glucose and 10,000 molecules of NAD+. Plus you would get to a point where you couldn't process any more glucose because there would be no NAD plus left. There'd be nothing to do the catching. And so if you're only going to do glycolysis and you're not going to bring things further along, you need to regenerate the NAD. So you need to put the electrons back, right, onto the metabolic intermediate. So you need to, you know, so, so that you can have some more NAD molecules. Here, if you want to start thinking about uh, the cellular state, these are the cellular state for the variety of metabolites we've seen throughout this pathway. You can see they're not one-to-one. -one. They're strategically manipulated so that this pathway is at equilibrium, except for those two, step one and step three in the beginning, and at the bit end of the pathway, pulling things through. And so if you look at delta G, this is the standard change in free energy. What step is this? What's the strongest bond we're breaking here? Carbon-carbon bond, aldolase. So this is where we're, from the standard state, this pathway would have troubles. But we put, remember we put the super enzyme right after that, we strategically placed it. So that starting from the cellular state, you have the two valve functions, the two regulatory steps, and then you have at the end of the line, you've got this um, tautomerization process, pulling metabolites through. So this is highly exergonic starting from the cellular state. This is also extra on This is the next step that we're going to see. We haven't seen this step yet, step 11. Okay, so overall, we've um, oxidized, uh, to, to remove two electrons from glucose. You can run through these numbers. This sort of summarizes what we've done so far. Some of that energy has been deposited in ATP. A large amount has been deposited in ADH. And overall, the pathway of glycolysis, glucose going to pyruvate, is exergonic, even starting from the cellular state. So equilibrium tends to uh, favor the forward direction of this pathway. But individual steps are manipulated, so they're either at equilibrium or exergonic. Okay, so starting from the cellular state, delta G would be more negative. All right. So now we've, we've done something good. We got two electrons out. We, we made some ATP. But now um, we've got this problem with we've got NADH and we're running out of NAD. So we need some way to reoxidize um, um, this molecule. Okay? Reoxidation of NADH to NAD is important because that's one of the substrates in, in the steps of this pathway. Okay? And the way that we're going to deal with this problem is a process called fermentation. Uh, and so fermentation is literally the deposition of electrons from NADH onto either pyruvate or another molecule. So there's two different types of fermentation. One makes lactate. So that happens when we're running around. We make lactate if we're not getting enough oxygen in our muscles when we're really going for it. And in uh, yeast, you can put those electrons onto ethanol. Okay, and that, that makes you happy. So here we go. So here's the two different processes, two different ways to, in an anaerobic state where we don't have oxygen, we need to put those electrons either onto pyruvate or onto acetaldehyde, as we'll see in a moment. But if we have oxygen, we'll see in the next lecture that we can literally throw that into a furnace and just start uh, making tremendous number of ATP molecules. But now, um, we don't have oxygen. So let's look at this fermentation. So in, in us, in our muscles, pyruvate, you can literally put these electrons directly back onto pyruvate to make lactate. See the oxidation state change? Do you see it? So here you have, what, oxidation state of two, right? And here you have oxidation state one, two, three, four, right? So you put those two electrons from NADH back onto lactate, and the critical thing is that we made, we create, we solved the problem, we made some NAD, we can do some more glycolysis, but we created another problem. We, we begin to accumulate lactate. So when you're running around and you get a cramp, that's this molecule right here building up in your muscles. 
And so it's slowly it's cleared away. It actually gets transported to your liver and gets metabolized there. Um, so this process is, uh, ha is a transfer of electrons. And so it's actually very exergonic. Um, it's not quite as exergonic as the oxidation reduction reaction we saw previously. Now in yeast, you can transform pyruvate to acid aldehyde. So you can decarboxylate. So when you drink beer, there's bubbles, right? And there's ethanol. And so this is what these organisms are doing. They're doing anaerobic fermentation. So this is not oxidation reduction. So if you can look at each of the carbons and see electrons have not come to either of these or been removed. This step is, so here this is oxidized and you re re reduce it down to ethanol. Okay, so this is the step where you're actually putting the electrons back on to acid aldehyde. So different organisms, different way to deal with this problem. So for each turn of glycolysis, you're just making two ATP molecules. In the absence of oxygen, you're sort of being counterproductive, right? So you're, you put all this energy in the NADH and then you just sort of put it back on the molecule. So all you've done is made two ATPs. And it, the cell needs a, a certain amount of energy. And so if we had oxygen, then we could make tremendous amounts of ATP from each glucose molecule. But here, we're only making two ATPs per molecule. So glycolysis obviously has to go very, very quickly. And so this is the Pasteur effect. The, the, the rate of glycolysis is extremely fast so that we can keep up with the cellular demand for ATP. We're very inefficiently only making two ATPs per round of this cycle. So aerobic restoration or, rest, or, rest, or, or uh, catabolism of sugars in the presence of oxygen is much more efficient. And so for each glucose molecule there, you're going to be making large amounts of ATP, so you need less flux through the pathway. And so this is a, a, something that you can measure in uh, microorganisms, and yeast, yeast as well, is this, you need a rapid flux um, for this process to regenerate that NAD. Okay, so we've come to the end. We've made pyruvate. This is glycolysis. Here ended the lesson on that. Let's move to another pathway. Um, so yes, we need to make energy from glucose, but we also need to feed other pathways from glucose. And so the pentose phosphate pathway is one of the scariest pathways I saw as a student. Um, don't panic. I don't know the steps. You don't need to know them. I'll tell you what you need to know as we go through this. The output of pentose phosphate is ribose 5-phosphate and NADB, NADPH. Remember, that's the reduced cofactor that's used in an holy Christmas. And that's that. And the next thing, no. <laughs> okay, so here's pentose phosphate. Mr. iPad will... Okay, so we're taking our glucose 6-phosphate. How did we make glucose 6-phosphate? Hexokinase. You remember? <laughs> Mr. Hexokinase made glucose 6-phosphate. And now we're going to immediately start removing electrons. So glucose 6-phosphate, we have the release of NADPH here, two electrons transferred. The second two electrons transferred. Bubbles coming out, carbon dioxide released. God, I'm so excited about this pathway I keep going for. So the output is two NADPH molecules and a ribose 5-phosphate. You're like, hey, I know what I can do with that. I can make some DNA and RNA. So now we're sort of transitioning. This is catabolic pathway, but it's leading into an anabolic process. We need some ribose 5-phosphates to make DNA and RNA. We also need NADPH for anabolic processes because those reduced cofactors will be used later on in the course to build up molecules. But do you see how there's two options here? One, circle. The other, down. So we can either make ribose 5-phosphate or NADPH, but as it turns out, the cell needs more NADPH than ribose 5-phosphate. So every time we do this non-oxidative phase of the pathway, we make two additional NADPHs and release a carbon dioxide. Okay? So we can regulate the amounts by regulating the enzymes at these decision points. We can either have an enzyme going this way 
or an enzyme going this way. And these are allosterically regulated. I'm not going to, if I tell you, you feel like you have to know it, so just, just realize that we can have different rates through this cyclic pathway or down into making DNA and RNA. So let's look at the steps real quick. Um, this is digestible. So here we have glucose 6-phosphate. You remove, uh, so this is a uh, aldose, right? Glucose is an aldose. So it's an ald it's in equilibrium with the linear form that's an aldehyde. We've oxidized by two electrons to a carboxylic acid. Do you see that? You see the carboxylic acid? Uh, and so that's a 6 phosphoglucose delta lactone um, We have an enzyme that can open up that ring, making the 6 phosphogluconate And then in the second step, um, we can transfer two more electrons by decarboxylating here and, um, and, and forming a, a new ketone. So you see the two electrons went into that ketone. That gets isomerized into an aldehyde. So we're moving electrons around. So you might say, okay, what do I got to know, man? Oh, I got to know these structures. You're sick, man. You're torturing us. No, you need to know what's going in, what's going out, and that you can regulate both independently. Okay, so what's coming out? Let's see. We'll have a pretend test now. What's coming out? Ribose, 5-phosphate, and we have NADP. Anything else coming out? Bubbles, yep. Yeah. Three things coming out. Okay, now... What if we want to regenerate this and make more NADPH? So we can actually take our five carbon sugar and transform it back into a six carbon sugar. And this is sick. I mean, look at this. You get all these enzymes. Don't even feel like you have to know this. Just know that you have, I, I put a little clue. <laughs> this is what you got to know. This is for me. I'm not too sh sharp. So you have six five carbon sugars coming in. You got a food fight in between. Carbons are being flicked between molecules back and forth. And then you have out the other side, you have six five carbon or five six carbon sugars coming out. So you have six five carbon sugars going in, and you've got five six carbons coming out. The number of carbons hasn't changed. There's not, I mean, many of these steps are at equilibrium. You're just sort of isomerizing, transferring pieces, parts. I just numbered the number of carbons at each step. I don't know any of these names. You don't either. You can look it up. You can even reduce it to this. This is just the number of carbons. You have these two five carbon sugars coming together, make a six, a seven, and a three carbon, yada, yada, yada. At the end, you've got six, five, six times five is 30, and five times six is 30. That's about as deep as you need to know this. And it's important because each time this turns around, you've taken a five carbon ribose and transformed it back into what you're going to feed into this pathway. The only way you're going to make more NADPH is to make that a six carbon sugar again. But it's a bit confusing because you're like, well, there's six of them. And you know, each time you go to the top, you fully oxidize six carbons, right? It's confusing. So don't worry about it. Just what goes in, what goes out, and it's logically regulated because you need different levels. Don't panic. It's all good. Okay, one last thing. Ah, this is painful. So this is a catabolic pathway. You can burn one fuel, glucose, but there's all kinds of other fuels in, you know, so in your beverages, the ones that didn't have the dipeptide sweetener. If you have sugar in your beverage, that's sucrose. That's not a... A, uh, a, a double or a, a disaccharide of glucose. It's a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. So what are we going to do with the fructose? Are we just going to excrete it, right? Make, take it, cut, cut off the glucose, throw out the rest? No. We can take those other molecules and feed them at different places into the pathway. So we can metabolize glucose, fructose, galactose, and mannose, and, uh, and lactose. Um, okay? And so... Fructose, here are the pathways. Um, you can either burn it as a fuel or convert it into glycerol and make some lipids. So you've got some choices. Nice to have choices in life. So fructose, remember this is that cheating kinase. It can phosphorate the C6 position of glucose, but also of fructose. So that same enzyme can make fructose 6-phosphate. We can bisphosphorylate it. And this is heading to glycolysis. Alternatively, we can monophosphorylate with a different enzyme at the C1 position. Hexokinase cheats, but only at C6. Fructokinase is needed to phosphorate C1. 
then we're, we're going to split a sugar that just has one phosphorylation. So if it just has one phosphorylation, one of the triose products is going to have a phosphate, the other isn't. So we make dihydroxyacetone phosphate, same as in glycolysis, and we're going to make glyceraldehyde. Now we have an option. Do we want to make some lipids? Almost all lipids have a glycerol molecule, so we can take our glyceraldehyde, convert it into glycerol, or we can phosphorylate glyceraldehyde and feed it into glycolysis. So we have options, and obviously there's going to be allosteric regulation. If we need more lipids, then this step's going to be inhibited and this enzyme is going to be activated. Okay. Galactose is an epimer of glucose uh, at the C4 position. What is an epimer? Like, oh, yeah. Just one and only one center has. Uh, do, you, do you see how galactose might be less stable than glucose? And why might that be thermodynamically? Because necessarily one of those hydroxyl groups needs to be in a not equatorial position, whereas glucose, one of the anomers, has all groups equatorial. So glucose is most stable. But galactose can, can occur. And so if we want to feed this into glycolysis, we're going to have to epimerize. We're going to have to switch that stereochemistry at that C4 position. So we phosphorylate position one. And then we have this, this UDP, uh, uridine diphosphate glucose. We're going to trans substitute the UDP group with the phosphate. Right? It's still a phosphoester, phosphoanhydride, yeah, phosphoester bond. Uh, and so now we have a UDP. UDP is a big honking molecule. The reason you're like, where did this come from? UDP is something you can grab onto. It's got some heft to it. Phosphate is a little thing. UDP is big. And so you can really grab your, your substrate with high specificity once you put the UDP on. And now while you're holding it tight, you take that hydroxyl group, and you oxidize it to carbonyl, eliminating the stereochemistry, and then you reduce in a stereoselective manner. Do you see what it's doing here? So you're going through this achiral in, uh, intermediate metabolite, carbonyl group, and then you're uh, reducing on the other side. And, it, and NAD is participating. It's like, I got it. I got your electron. And then it gives it back to the molecule in a stereoselective manner. So this is an epimerase. It's inverted the stereochemistry at that position. And now we're good to go. We've basically got UDP glucose. We just got to get rid of this thing that we're holding on to, this UDP group. And so we transfer it back there, make glucose 1-phosphate. Not quite what we need. We need glucose 6-phosphate for glycolysis. So we have a isomerizing enzyme, a gluco, phosphoglucomutase. Okay. We made it. Yay.
Oh, so this is a very hard question, and I'm going to give you a hint because I'm not trying to make you all fail this class. So can you guys remember the question? Because I'm going to show you a slide that is helpful. And I'm going to keep the voting on because this is too many people missing it. So the answer is there. 